Well, good morning to all of you, and I greet you in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. Uh, Kentucky is a very special place in my heart because we have so many supporters here and because I found my wife here. Uh, in fact, somebody gave me a little uh, magnet that I have on the refrigerator that is in the shape of the state of Kentucky, and it says, I got lucky in Kentucky. <laughs> so, uh, and this church means a lot to me. I've spoken here many times. In fact, the first time I ever spoke here, a long time ago in the 80s, Bob Russell was still here, and he nearly worked me to death. I came in, I spoke three times, I think, on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning. He really knows how to squeeze it out of a guy. So uh, anyway, uh, I've been back several times since then. I love this place, and I appreciate your presence this morning, and I appreciate uh, Hike's uh, point uh, hosting this. Before I get started, I just want to introduce you to a new Bible that has just been published called the Legacy Study Bible. Uh, this is a very exciting Bible for me. Uh, I consider it one of the best on the market today. Uh, it is an updated version of the New American Standard Version, which came out in 1971, and which I consider to be the most conservative of all translations. I've used the New American Standard for 50 years now, and this update was made by John MacArthur's uh, Master's Seminary in California. California, so you know it has to be a very conservative translation. Now, one of the things that characterizes it is that at long last, at long last, it is the first Bible ever published that uses the name of God instead of the King James Code. When the King James translators translated the Bible, they put a code in that most people are not aware of. And the code is this, that every place the name of God appears, Yahweh, they put the word Lord all in capital letters. The name of Yahweh appears in the Bible 6,800 times, and in most Bibles it does not appear one time. And when they come to Lord, they put Adonai in small letters, Lord, Adonai, small letters. So it's very, very confusing. Why did they do that? Because there was a tradition among the Jewish people that you never said the name of God, Yahweh, because it was a silly superstition, because they believed that if you said the name of God, you would take his name in vain. Well, how can you take the name of God in vain if you're just reading it out of the Bible? It's just ridiculous. So they never said the name of God. They, when they come to Yahweh, they would say Adonai. But it leads to tremendous confusion. Look, for example, Exodus 3.15, God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and it is a memorial name to all generations. Where is the name of God? You read that, and it's, he's telling you what his name is, and his name's not there. Lord is not a name. Lord is a title. So, in the New uh, Living Standard, uh, Legacy Standard Bible, Yahweh, the God of our fathers. You get the name of God. For example, Psalm 113.1, praise the Lord, praise O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. But notice Lord is all in capital letters. Here's what it actually says, praise Yah. Yah is an abbreviation that the Jews use for Yahweh. Praise, O slaves of Yahweh. Praise the name of Yahweh. Look at Psalm 8.9, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What is his name? It's not Lord. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Or Deuteronomy 32, 3, for I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. What is the name of the Lord? Don't know there. For I proclaim the name of Yahweh. Ascribe greatness to our God. Or consider Psalm 110, 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. If you didn't know the King James Code, you would think God was talking to himself there. The Lord says to my Lord. No. Yahweh says to my Lord. Yahweh is speaking to Jesus. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. If you want to get a copy of this Bible, you can download it free of charge at read.lsbible.org. Read.lsbible.org. It's free of charge. Just download it. You have it on your computer or your phone. If you want to purchase a copy, you go to 316publishing.com. That's like John 316. 316publishing.com. You can buy paperback, hardback, or leather copies of the Bible. Now, I uh, retired, so to speak, on June the 1st of 2021. And in the 
two years since then, I've written four books. That's what I'm focusing my time on these days. The first one I published was this one, America's Suicide, which speaks for itself. The second one was, What's the Difference in a Millennium and a Millipede? I found out most people don't know. It's Understanding End Time Viewpoints. The third one is Islam and Christianity, Two Roads, or the Two Roads to the Same God. They are not. And the latest one, which is at the publisher now and should be out by the end of this month is entitled The Nine Wars of the End Times. So maybe by the end of, of this month that one will be out. Let me show you a couple of, uh, of church signs that relate to my topic this morning. Government making sin legal does not make it right. Gradually, think about this now, gradually the unthinkable becomes tolerable, then acceptable, then legal, then praised. And that's where we are in America today. We're calling evil good and good evil. Or this church I love. Abortion is murder. Sodomy is abominable. God is the same. America is in trouble. This church is not compromising with the world. How about this one? Something is seriously wrong when the world is offended by everything except sin. And finally, have the donkey and the elephant let you down will turn to the lamb. <laughs> Good advice. I have sort of reworded my topic this morning, but it's the same thing, America's lost hope. And I want to begin with two key scriptures. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, and then righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Folks, the American constitutional system was the very first government ever devised by man that was based upon the Word of God. Its cornerstone, the cornerstone of our government was a belief in the evil nature of man, which produced a conviction that no person can be trusted with power. This view of man is, as being basically evil is based on the Bible, which warns us, do not trust in men, do not trust in princes or politicians, and do not trust in yourself. And the reason for these warnings is found in Jeremiah 17, thus says Yahweh, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind, blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh. Why shouldn't we trust in each other or trust in mankind or trust in politicians? Jeremiah 17 continues, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Well, we are to trust only in the Lord, as Isaiah puts it in 26, the steadfast of mine you keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh forever, for in Yahweh himself we have an everlasting uh, rock. Basing a government system on the belief that man's nature is corrupted and, irrep and, and ir irreparable, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, represented a radical departure from history. Until that time, most of mankind had always been ruled by kings who were considered to have a divine right to rule and who usually ruled like they thought they were gods. I am reminded, for example, of the children of Israel who arrived in the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. The Lord God Almighty served as their king. You're probably well aware of that. He protected them. He blessed them with freedom and with prosperity. As long as they obeyed God, as long as they obeyed Him, they experienced peace and freedom. But when they rebelled against God, he would punish them by allowing foreign nations to enslave them. And when they would cry out to him in repentance, he would raise up leaders called judges who would deliver them from foreign domination. And then they would go once again in this circle over and over and over again throughout the book of Judges. Until finally, the people came to Samuel, who was the last judge, and they said to Samuel, we want a king. And he said, no, you don't want a king. They said, we want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. We don't want to be separate. We don't want to be distinct. We want to be like all the other nations. He said, let me warn you, if you have a king, a man who's a king, and you put him over you, he will he will uh, treat you terribly. He will take your young men and send them into wars. He will manip manipulate your young women. He will take your fields. He will put taxes on you. You will despise him. But they would not listen. They said, we want to be like all the other nations. And so he gave them a king, a long history of abusive kings, starting with King Samuel. The American colonists rebelled against such a king, and they had no intention of replacing the British monarch with an American 
What is amazing is that they did not proceed to establish an oligarchical form of government. <coughs> Why do I say that's astonishing? Because most of the leaders of the American Revolution were oligarchs. They were, uh, uh, they were uh, people who were uh, landed aristocrats. But the majority of them were also Christians and devout Christians. According to our founding fathers, they did not trust anyone, even themselves. They therefore established a form of government that would limit the use of power. Equally important was their conviction that the Word of God constitutes a higher law to which all men and governments are subject and that the fundamental rights of mankind are derived from that law and not from government. And thus, in our Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their Creator, by the Creator, with certain inalienable rights which among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To put it another way, our founding fathers expressly rejected the traditional philosophy of humanism. Humanism is the concept that man is basically good and capable of perfection and that therefore those who are highly educated have a right to rule over those who are less educated. They are also rejected the radical form of humanism that came to prevail in the French Revolution which produced a reign of terror and a river of blood. This form of humanism was based on a belief in the essential goodness of the common man. And the common man is no better than the educated man. He's still a sinner. Again, because of their worldview, our founding fathers trusted absolutely no one. They did not trust monarchy. They did not trust oligarchy. They did not trust democracy. Because they knew that democracy always evolves into mobocracy. And so they established what was called a representative republic with an ingenious set of checks and balances. For example, in the original government, most people are astonished at this, in the original government established by our Constitution, there was only one national official that was directly elected by the people. Only one. And that was the local congressman who was to serve for two years. Senators were selected by state legislatures, not by popular vote. The state legislatures selected them. And that was true until 1913 when the 17th Amendment was adopted and senators were directly elected after that. Likewise, the president was not originally selected by direct election. Instead, he was selected by voters who voted for electors. They didn't vote for the president. They voted for electors of a president. Today, all electors are selected by popular vote. Until this century, until the 20th century, the electors themselves were selected by state legislatures, not by popular vote. They were selected by state legislatures. Now they're selected by popular vote. But when you go and vote for the president, you are still voting for a group of electors who have pledged that they will vote for that particular candidate you voted for. And sometimes they don't do that. Sometimes they vote for whoever they want to. Thus, in the election, for example, of 2000, George Bush was selected as president by the Electoral College, even though his opponent, Al Gore, garnered 500,000 more votes than Bush did. The same thing was true in 2016 in the election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Trump won the Electoral College, but Hillary Clinton won 3 million more votes than he did. Our founding fathers also divided the powers of government between the federal government and the state government. And within the federal government, they divided it further. They divided it between the legislative, judicial, and executive branches. And again, this was taken directly from the Bible in Isaiah 33 where it says, For Yahweh is our judge, Yahweh is our lawgiver, and Yahweh is our king. There you have it. The the legislative and the uh, judicial and the executive forms of government. Also, the basic rights of the people to be protected from all government intrusion were spelled out in the Constitution's Bill of Rights. Folks, the philosophical concept undergirding all the actions of our founding fathers was the belief that Christian morality was absolutely essential for both the preservation of liberty and the stability of law. They emphasized this crucial point in their writings over and over again. It's so crucial. I want to put it on the screen for you to read. The philosophical concept undergirding all the actions of our founding fathers was the belief that Christian morality 
was absolutely essential for both the preservation of liberty and the stability of law. And our whole constitutional system is based upon the assumption that there will always be a foundation of Christian values. Look at Samuel Adams, for example. Samuel Adams was the governor of Massachusetts, signer of the Declaration of Independence, organizer of the Boston Tea Party. He said, a general dissolution of principles and manners will more surely overthrow the liberties of America than the whole force of the common enemy. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. But when they lose their virtue, and we've lost it today, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. Religion and good morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness. Consider this man, Benjamin Rush. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was an attendee at the Continental Congress, and he was a physician and served as the first Surgeon General of the United States. He wrote, the only foundation for a republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue virtue, and without virtue there can be no liberty, and liberty is the object in life of all Republican governments. Consider Patrick Henry, well-known, first governor of Virginia, member of the Continental Congress. The great pillars of all government and of social life are virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor, and this alone, that renders us invi uh, uh, invincible. And then there's George Washington. Washington was uh, the first governor of Virginia and a member of the Continental Congress, and he was also the uh, first president of the United States. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. What pillars? Religion and morality. Consider John Adams. John Adams was a member of the Continental Congress, one of the drafters of the Declaration of Independence, and the second uh, president of the United States. He wrote, We have no government armed in power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to govern any other. Consider Thomas Jefferson, who was uh, a, a believer in God but not a Christian. Thomas Jefferson wrote, uh, No nation has ever yet existed or been governed without religion, nor can it be. The Christian religion is the best religion that has ever been given to man, and as I... As, and I, as a chief magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. Or consider James Madison, political philosopher, consider the father of the, of the Constitution, the father of the Bill of Rights. This man uh, was a member of the House of Representatives and the fourth president of the United States. He wrote, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. This concept of the inalienable interdependence of the Constitution and Christianity was not just characteristic of our founding fathers. It has continued to be emphasized throughout our history until this day. For example, Noah Webster, he was considered the father of American education. He uh, was the publisher of the American Dictionary of the English Language, and in 1828 he wrote, No truth is more evident in my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. Consider John Quincy Adams, American diplomat, member of the Senate, sixth president of the United States. On the occasion of the 45th celebration of the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, it's connected in one indissoluble bond, the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. And then there's Alexis de Tocqueville, who was a French historian who toured the United States in 1830. He wrote this, upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. The Americans combined the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Daniel Webster, United States Senator from Massachusetts, Secretary of State, he wrote, 
No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. To preserve the government, we must also preserve morals. Morality rests on religion. If you destroy that foundation, the superstructure will fall, and we are witnessing its failure today. Then there's William McGuffey. William McGuffey was an American educator and author of McGuffey's Reader, which was first published in 1836. He wrote, The Christian religion is the religion of our country. From it are derived our prevalent notions of the character of God, the great moral governor of the universe. On its doctrines are founded the peculiarities of our free institutions. The New York State Legislature in 1838 declared, This is a Christian nation. Our government depends on that virtue that has its foundation in the morality of the Christian religion. Andrew Johnson the victorious commander of American forces in the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, military governor of Florida, seventh president of the United States. Speaking of the Bible, he said, that book, sir, is the rock upon which our republic rests. Then there's the Supreme Court of the United States in 1892. It said in one of its decisions, this is a Christian nation. We are a Christian people, and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity. Calvin Coolidge who was the governor of Massachusetts, vice president of the United States, and 30th president of the United States. He wrote, the foundation of our society and government rests so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be practically universal in our country, which has happened today. The United States Supreme Court in 1931 said, we are a Christian people according to one another the equal right of religious freedom and acknowledging with reverence the due obedience of the will of God. Franklin Roosevelt, governor of New York, 32nd president of the United States, he wrote, we cannot read the history of our rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible has occupied in shaping the advances of the republic. Where we have been the truest and most consistent in obeying its precepts, we have attained the greatest measure of contentment and prosperity. Peter Marshall, one of my Christian favorites, a Scottish-American preacher, a pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., and chaplain of the United States Senate, the Billy Graham of his time. He said this, may it ever be understood, this is in a prayer before the U.S. Senate, may it ever be understood that our liberty is under God and we can be found nowhere else. We were born that way as the only nation on earth that came into being for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Take Earl Warren, for example, Governor of California, 14th Chief Justice of the United States. When he became Chief Justice, appointed by President Eisenhower, Time Magazine interviewed him. In that interview, he said something that if any justice of the Supreme Court were to say today, they would be immediately impeached. Here's what he said. I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. Whether we look to the first charter of Virginia or the charter of New England, the the same objective is present, a land governed by Christian principles. I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it. I like to believe we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I like also to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to this country. Eisenhower, who appointed him, said, without God, there can be no American form of government. He said, recognition of the supreme being is the first and most basic expression of Americanism. Ronald Reagan, governor of California and our 40th uh, president of the United States said, America needs God more than God needs America. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation gone under. And then there is this man, Clay Christensen, a person you've probably never heard of. He died in 2020, in January of 2020. He was a renowned professor of business administration at Harvard University. He was considered to be the world's top management thinker. Here's what he had to say in an interview about the necessity of religion in the existence of America's form of government. Sound? Let me back it up and start it over again. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a Marxist economist from China. He was coming to the end of a Fulbright Fellowship. And he 
and without any hesitation he said, yeah, I had no idea how critical religion is to the functioning of democracy. The reason why democracy works, he said, is not because the government was designed to oversee what everybody does, but rather democracy works because most people, most of the time, voluntarily choose to obey the law. And in your past, most Americans attended a church or a synagogue every week, and they were taught there by people who they respected. My friend went on to say that Americans followed these rules because they had come to believe that they weren't just accountable to society, they were accountable to God. My Chinese friend heightened a vague but nagging concern I've harbored inside that as religion loses its influence over the lives of Americans, what will happen to our democracy? Where are the institutions that are going to teach the next generation of Americans that they too need to voluntarily choose to obey the laws? Because if you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. I want to emphasize that very last statement. It's where we are today. If you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. Our desertion of religion and our departure from the founding principles of our nation has occurred very rapidly. It has occurred in my lifetime. I've watched our nation put the gun to its head and get ready to commit suicide. It began with the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and has accelerated rapidly since that time. Our public schools have rejected the teaching of Christian morality and prayer within their walls has been declared unconstitutional along with the Ten Commandments. When I was growing up in public schools in Waco, Texas, we began each day with prayer. We began each day with reading from the Bible. We were taught Christian principles. My English reader in sen as a senior in high school, I had an English reader that was about that thick, and everything in it was stories from the Bible with mor um, um, morals at the end. And yet it is unthinkable that such a thing could exist today. In like manner, the textbooks of our nation have been cleansed of all references to our Christian heritage. Instead of learning about the essentiality of Christianity to our form of government, our children are being indoctrinated with the so-called principle of the separation of church and state, which is never once mentioned in our Constitution. As a result, most Christians today would be amazed to learn that most of the historical facts about our Christian heritage, facts that were previously contained in American history books, have been erased from the modern textbooks. Take Christopher Columbus, for example. He is vilified in modern textbooks, and no mention is made of the true purpose of his voyage. Here's what he wrote in the log of his ship as he was crossing the Atlantic. It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel His hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail from here, Spain, to the Indies. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because He comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. Our Lord Jesus Christ desired to perform a very obvious miracle in the voyage to the Indies to comfort me and the whole people of God." There were 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Nearly all of them were Christians. 24 of them were seminary graduates. Five days after the Declaration was adopted, the Continental Congress voted to use public funds to hire military chaplains. And the Congress also ordered the importation of 20,000 Bibles for the American troops. General George Washington sent out a letter to his regiments, which stated, The general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor so to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier, defending the dearest rights and liberties of this country. A general who sent out such a letter today would immediately be stripped of his command. Can you imagine the firestorm of criticism that would be occur as a result of such a letter? Through all 50 states, all of them, without exception, all 50 states, there runs an appeal and reference to God as the creator of our liberties and the preserver of our freedoms. Here's how it's expressed in the Kentucky State Constitution. We, the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, grateful to Almighty God for the civil, political, and religious liberties we enjoy, and invoking the continuance of these blessings, do ordain and establish this Constitution. 
The Constitution of Texas has a similar statement. Humbly invoking the blessings of Almighty God, the people of the state of Texas do ordain and establish this Constitution. The New England Primer, first published in 1690, remained the nation's most popular school textbook for more than 100 years, selling roughly 5 million copies in a nation that only had 6 million people. It was uh, supplanted finally uh, in 1836 by McGuffey's Reader, which uh, uh, was filled with biblical principles and religious instruction. It ultimately sold more than 120 million copies and was recognized in every state as a public school textbook. Almost every one of the 123 colleges and universities established in the United States had Christian origins and purposes. Truth for Christ, Christ and the church. Truth for Christ and the church was the official logo, the official motto of Harvard University. And over the years, as our society secularized, that motto was quietly changed. It was changed to veritas, which just simply means truth. Also, students at Harvard University were told this, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That's what every student had to focus on when they entered Harvard when it was founded. Yale University, founded in 1701, issued this charge to its students. Above all, have an eye to the great end of all your studies, which is to obtain the clearest conceptions of divine things and to lead you to a saving knowledge of God in His Son, Jesus Christ. The United States government issued Bibles to all the troops in World War II, which contained the following statement from President Franklin Roosevelt. As Commander-in-Chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. And and on the eve of June the 6th, 1944, the eve of the D-Day invasion of Europe, Franklin Roosevelt went on the radio and he read a six and a half minute prayer. Here's an excerpt. This day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. For the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces, Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. Excerpt from the six and a half minute prayer. Thankfully, uh, when the World War II monument was dedicated in Washington, D.C. in 2014. It was discovered to the horror of many people that although the entire text of that prayer was supposed to be emblazoned upon that monument, it had been taken off by the Obama administration. And so, Congress later passed a bill demanding that the prayer be added to the memorial, and this was finally accomplished in 2022, thank God. The words, under God, were not added to the Pledge of Allegiance by Congress until 1954. That's just 69 years ago. And yet today it is unthinkable that such words would be put into the Pledge of Allegiance. And furthermore, there are people who are working hard now to take them out of the Pledge of Allegiance. In God We Trust was not adopted as our national motto until 1956. And yet President Obama consistently told his audiences that the national motto of the United States is e pluribus unum, meaning from one many, meant from many one. Both chambers of the House and the Senate at our National Capitol building feature the inscription, In God We Trust, on their walls. Now, folks, the amazing thing, 
The absolutely amazing thing is that this rich Christian heritage of our nation is being ignored or erased today in our schools, both on the public school level and the university level. Take, for example, this horrible book titled A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, a professor at Columbia University, published in 1980. It has become the leftist Bible of American history. It ignores our Christian heritage. It makes villains of our founding fathers. These so-called historians have, may have an overwhelmingly secular, even pagan bias. But the interesting thing is that Jewish leaders in America fully understand the importance of our Christian heritage and have spoken out strongly in behalf of it. Consider, for example, Jeff Jacoby, uh, a, a columnist for the Boston Globe. This is a Christian country. It was founded by Christians and built on broad Christian principles. Threatening? Far from it. It is precisely this Christian uh, country that Jews have known the most peaceful, prosperous, and successful existence in their long history. Consider Don Fetter, a Jewish columnist for the Boston Herald. He wrote, clearly this nation was established by Christians. As a Jew, I am entirely comfortable with the concept of a Christian America. The choice isn't Christian America or nothing, but Christian America or a neo-pagan, hedonistic, rights without responsibility, anti-family, culture of fear, culture of death America. And that's exactly where we are. And then there's the Orthodox rabbi, uh, Daniel Lapine of Seattle, Washington, both a prolific author, author and the host of a radio, syndicated radio uh, talk show. In his profound book, America's Re Real War, he wrote, I will argue that America is a religious nation, but I shall go much further than that. America is not just religious, but is rooted in one particular religious tradition. As an Orthodox rabbi, I will make a compelling case for America as a Christian nation and the need for our nation to be based on Judeo-Christian ethics in order to survive. He says, the origins, legal system, ethos, and moral sense of America are entirely Judeo-Christian, which is absolutely denied by the professors in our universities today. Continuing, Obama, when he became president, said this over and over, we are no longer a Christian nation. You know what? He was certainly, in a sense, true about that. In 1976, 91% of all Americans claimed to be Christians. 1976. In 2022, 64 percent. That is horrendous drop in a very short period of time. And only 23 percent of those Christians claim to be born again. And worse still, polls show that only 9 percent of those who call themselves Christians can be classified as having a biblical worldview. That means that most professing Christians in America today are merely just cultural Christians who are Christians in name only. But this sad fact does not negate the historical evidence that our founding fathers established this nation on Christian principles and that those principles will serve as the basis of our constitutional structure and laws. The problem, of course, is that increasingly today, our, form of our, our society and government are becoming dominated by secularists, who are determined to cut America away from its Judeo-Christian foundation. They have a classic European-style humanistic worldview that despises Christianity, despises capitalism, and the result is that freedom is endangered. We have become a secular pagan society devoid of values that contribute to virtue and civility and the amazing thing that has happened so fast. The hope we have always had about the future has dissipated because we are now a nation that has forgotten God. A nation that has forgotten God. When Alexander Solzhenitsyn came to this nation, after he was kicked out of the Soviet Union, he went to Harvard University to speak, and they received him as a conquering hero. And when he finished his speech, he had been booed throughout, and he left a pariah. You know why? Because he said, America is on the same track as Russia. He said, I asked my forefathers over and over, why did we suffer 70 years under Stalin, 70 years under communism? And the answer was always the same, he said. We forgot God. And he said, that's exactly where America is today. And that was back in the 1970s. You are forgetting about God. And the result is that we are a deeply divided, fractured nation 
Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew? A nation divided against itself cannot stand. As I said before, our rapid decline began with the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. It's resulted in an epidemic of immorality and violence. We now spend more money each year on gambling than we do on food. We have murdered 63 million babies since 1973 in the name of freedom of choice for women. We're actively promoting all forms of sexual perversion. And although we constitute only 5% of the world's population, we consume over 50% of all the illegal drugs in the world. And through our immoral, violent, and blasphemous TV programs and movies, we have become the moral polluter of planet Earth. God has raised up prophetic voices like Dave Wilkerson to call us to repentance. And when we have failed to respond. He has stricken us with remedial judgments like the 9-11 attacks and Hurricane Katrina, but our response has been one of patriotism instead of repentance. We have cried out, God bless America, when we should have been praying, America bless God. There are several things that are desperately needed in our nation today. First, we need to remind ourselves that all of our blessings, all of them, have come from God and not from ourselves. Second, we need to repent of forgetting about God and rejecting His Word. Third, we need pastors with the courage of Jeremiah, the courage to proclaim the unpopular message that we are a nation in rebellion against God and a nation that needs to repent. And fourth, we need the Christians with the courage of Daniel, determined to live Christian lives in the midst of increasing spiritual darkness. Instead, we find even evangelical churches all across this nation getting in bed with the world, trying to please the world instead of pleasing God. One of the Jeremiah pastors in our nation today is this man, Kevin Shrum, pastor of the Inglewood Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Here is what he had to say in the spring of 2014 in a sermon entitled, The Truth About Post-Christian America. The slippery slope of morality has now become a proverbial landslide of moral morass. What seemed to be a slow decline has now exponentially accelerated. The parading and applauding of all things unbiblical and immoral has reached its zenith on the shoulders of the autonomous self where me myself and I are the arbiters of all things truthful and spiritual. Gone is any reference to transcendent authority. How does one live as a Christian in an era where same-sex marriage is now the norm, where homosexuality is openly celebrated, where hypocrisy in the church is consistently exposed, where atheism is not just an alternative intellectual opinion but a hostile enemy, where Christianity is viewed as the enemy and not the founder and friend of America, and where the spiritual shallowness of many Christians, especially evangelical Christians, is being exposed for what it is, an Americanized version of cultural Christianity that is not authentic, genuine, or biblically orthodox. Oh, my friends, there is some good news in the midst of all this, believe it or not. There really is some good news. And the good news is, there's both good news and bad news. <laughs> the bad news is that we're on the verge of national suicide. The, the good news is that this decline of Christianity, this terrible decline, uh, this outbreak that we have now of immorality and violence is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We're told in Matthew 24, Jesus said He would return at a time when society was once again as violent and immoral as it was in the days of Noah. And my friends, we have arrived. We are in a world and a society that is out of control. But let us face the future with hope. Our nation may be doomed, but the prophetic scriptures reveal that Christians have a fabulous future to look forward to, and that future will be presented by the rest of our speakers today. Meanwhile, keep in mind that God is on His throne. God is in control. Even in the midst of all this terrible stuff we see on the news today, God has the wisdom and He has the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of His Son. So look forward to that glorious day when Jesus will return in majesty and glory to reign over all the world. And with that thought in mind, all I have to add is Maranatha, 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 come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise the Lord.